bats. Just the thought of them can send shivers down our spines. Many of us think these strange creatures of the night are to be feared, not loved. But to biologists, bats are beautiful and baffling. The lives of these nocturnal mammals are filled with mystery. And nowhere do bats baffle scientists more than in the tropical jungle of Panama. Here, scientists have discovered something amazing. 72 different species of bats, all living together on one tiny island. That's more bats than on the entire European continent. How can so many bats thrive in such a small place? To answer this question, it will take a special group of scientists. Scientists willing to put up with months of sleepless nights and tick-infested forests. Scientists like the bat women of Panama. Panama is the dividing line between North and South America, and the country itself is cut neatly into two by the Panama Canal. In the center of the canal lies Barro Colorado Island, better known as BCI. BCI is the world's leading location for the study of tropical forests. The island is run by the Smithsonian Institute and is mecca for bat scientists. The bat population on BCI reaches tens of thousands. But it's not the quantity that astounds scientists, it's the diversity. 72 different species living together on this one small island, only 15 square kilometers in size. How do they all fit? German scientist Elizabeth Kalko is obsessed with answering that question. She's a world expert on bats and for the past 15 years has spent more than 1,000 nights studying the bats in this forest. When I came here for the first time, I was simply overwhelmed. I had never been for such a long period of time in a tropical rainforest. And it was, for me, it was a magical world. Magical, but mysterious. The puzzle of the bats proved irresistible, and to help her solve it, Elizabeth has brought together a team of remarkable scientists, the bat women of Panama. There's doctoral candidate Krista Weiss, in charge of a nightly netting operation. Nina Spain is so taken with bats that she's now in year three of what was supposed to be a one-year study. Rachel Page and Jody Sedlock are two Americans on the team. They study fast-flying bats that hunt in wide open spaces and a bat that hunts down on the forest floor. Dina Deckman spies on bats in their roosts with the latest video technology. And Fanny Vetterick scales the heights of research by setting her nets to catch bats at the very top of the forest canopy. Each study is basically a piece of a big mosaic where we want to get a bigger picture about diversity patterns. And for that, we need to put in piece by piece by piece to get this mosaic together. So the forest on BCI is like a giant mosaic. From a distance, it looks like one single image. But to understand it, you have to get up close and study each element, each bat, in detail. Only then does the mosaic reveal a bigger picture, one of extraordinary specialization. And one thing is for sure. The bats won't give up their secrets that easily. The bat women have their work cut out for them. Step one in piecing the mosaic together will be to verify exactly how many species of bats live in this forest. That's Krista Weiss's job. Every night, Krista sets up her simple mobile laboratory, a tarp in case it rains, a couple of chairs, and a folding table. By dusk, all is prepared, and the night shift gets underway.
One of the reasons I'm working here in Panama in the tropics is because there are very many different species of bats and you know there are huge differences in coloration and sizes and bat species do have very different characters as well. Some of them are, are, are very aggressive in a way, they'll try and bite you when they can, they'll make a fuss when you've got them in the net or when you're holding them in your hand, they'll be bickering at you. And some bats, they're so calm, there are very big differences between them. Each bat is placed in canvas bags to keep it calm and then hung from a clothesline. Then Krista runs through a checklist. The most important job, identify the species. Check. Then measure its weight. Check. Probe for parasites. Check. Determine its sex. Check. Like us, bats are mammals and have the same sexual organs as we do. And like us, they nurse their young, so Krista can easily tell if a female is pregnant. Finally, she checks for signs of age by examining the bat's joints. Bats have 10 fingers, just like us, but bats use their fingers to fly. A bat wing is nothing more than an ingenious webbing of skin stretched over its thin fingers. After she completes the examination, Krista feeds the bats sugar water, a boost of energy and a reward for tolerating all the poking and prodding. More than 70,000 bats have been captured and catalogued since the 1970s when researchers began building a bat database on BCI. With so many bats now cataloged, the scientists can say with confidence that BCI does indeed have 72 different bat species. The number of tiles in the mosaic is set at 72. But in all these years of nightly netting, there is one incredible species that has only ever been captured once before. That is, until tonight. Hey! Hey, look at this! Nina Spain has caught the biggest and rarest of BCI's bats. It's called Vampirum Spectrum, better known as the false vampire bat. Catching a vampire was something really special now for me because this is just a really rare bat. I mean, it's on, on the top of food pyramid and it's huge. I mean, compared to all the other bats I had in my hand so far, it's just amazing. The false vampire is the largest bat in the tropics of the New World. It doesn't drink blood like the true vampire bats, but it is a serious carnivore. feeding on lizards, birds, rats, frogs, and even other bats. Compared with other bats, the false vampire is a giant. Its wings are nearly a meter long. Catching a false vampire is an amazing stroke of luck. So little is known about this bat and how it fits into the mosaic. To learn more about it and its life on BCI, Nina attaches a small radio transmitter to its back. The transmitter will only stay put for a few days but it will give Nina some vital clues about this elusive animal. BCI has seven radio towers placed strategically around the island. Biologists here use radio tracking not just with bats, but with ocelots, slots, agoutis, and birds. Radio tracking allows the scientists to follow the animals through the dense jungle.
Three days after releasing the false vampire, Nina sets off in search of it. The signal picked up by the towers gives her the general vicinity. Now she uses a handheld receiver to home in on the bat's exact position. The signal comes and goes with each curve in the path and change of direction. Finally, she gets a strong signal loud and clear at the base of this tall tree. Could the false vampire's roost be inside? To find out, Nina will have to wait for nightfall when the bats emerge. And she'll need help to see in the dark, so she sets up an infrared camera. In the early evening, the camera reveals movement in the tree hollow. Nina catches a glimpse of the radio transmitter still on the bat's back. This is a great success, the first discovery of a false vampire roost on BCI. The first and largest bat tile is placed in the mosaic. The false vampire discovered roosting in the hollow of a large tree. But to fit the other 71 species into this small forest, it's critical that they don't all compete for the same home. So where do all the other species roost? Inevitably, in a rainforest, animals must put up with rain. Days and days of rain. Bats find it hard to keep warm when they are wet, even in the tropics. So a good roost protects them in bad weather. Some bats could be called squatters. They move into hollowed out tree trunks, fallen logs, or abandoned mines. Others are construction workers who build their own roosts. The great white-lined bat makes its home by biting into palm fronds and then shaping them into a natural tent. Not surprisingly, this bat is also called the tent maker bat. Roosts also offer protection from predators. A snake after a tent maker bat could never climb this thin trunk without being noticed. But one bat goes to extremes in building its roost. It burrows inside live termite nests. And this is the focus of Dina Deckman's attention. Ladder in hand, Dina and Nina head into the forest in search of these exceptional builders. Most bats don't make their own roosts, but depend on existing structures, such as caves or tree holes or man-made structures like buildings or mines. And just a couple of bats have developed the ability to make their own roosts. Dina wants to know why this bat makes such an effort to build its own roost. It may need to spend several nights burrowing into the termite mound before its roost is complete. Dina sets up an infrared camera to peer inside the roost. She times her research around a full moon because this is when the bats spend more time inside. If they venture out in the bright moonlight, they can be spotted easily by predators like owls. 
When she turns on the camera, she can see as many as eight bats inside the roost. The bats partition off a chamber separate from the termites who, amazingly, leave the bats alone. Termites usually fight off intruders, but for a reason not yet understood, they allow these bats to take up residence inside their nest. Most bats are social creatures, living in groups of varying sizes. They have greeting rituals for each bat returning to the roost. The more important a bat is in its family hierarchy, the more elaborate the greeting. After observing these bats for months, Dina concludes that just one single male is the roost builder and that this is how he attracts mates, by offering a safe, secure place for them to give birth and raise their young. Digging into a termite nest may be an extreme way to carve out a niche in the crowded forest, but if it guarantees not just a home, but also a mate, it's well worth the effort. But there's more than one way to woo a bat. Sometimes all it takes is a little perfume and an eye for architecture. That's the story of our next bat in the mosaic. Bats can be very creative in choosing their roosts. Along the Panama Canal are several abandoned stone lighthouses, which provide spacious homes for colonies of the sack-winged bat. These bats organize themselves into harems, with each colony having between eight and 10 females, but only two or three resident males. One male is dominant and will mate with as many females as he can. To keep them, the male sack wing has a unique ritual which he performs every afternoon before the evening hunt. He concocts a strong perfume which he stores inside a sack in his wing. Microbes then ferment the brew until it's truly pungent. So the bag that they have on here on their forearm, this is filled with mixture of urine and ejaculate and spit, which sounds pretty awful, but actually it, it doesn't smell doesn't smell too bad. And they can open and close their wings with a muscle. So the bag is filled and then the, the males hover in front of the females in order to attract them. While they're moving their wings, it, like the smell goes from the bag in the direction of the females. It's, it's real quick. It's like taking off the wall, two, three, four wing beats and then hanging back. The male sack wing sprays its smelly concoction on the females, possibly to mark them as his own and to tell other males they're off bounds. To keep the aroma strong, he sprays throughout the day. Sack wings aren't the only species on BCI to take advantage of man-made structures. Close to home, right in the scientists' living quarters, Elizabeth is following the habits of the common large-eared bat. This bat story here literally unfolds under a staircase. When I got here to BCI about 10 years ago, I was intrigued by the piles of wings that I found under one of the staircases. Actually, these wings were just not any kind of wings. I saw that there were many dragonfly wings, beetle wings, candidate wings. To find out what's going on here, Elizabeth puts the roost under surveillance. Look at that, they look like oh, bats yeah. on a cloth line. They do. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right here under the house. Yeah. And it didn't take me long to find out that every night little bats were fluttering in and out, bringing in food, eating it there and clipping the wings off the bodies of the insects. I was really intrigued by that because who has ever heard of a bat that eats dragonflies? One bat is hanging and it twitches its ears, moves the whole body and seems to listen to something that happens around it so maybe there's a second bat i can oh yeah oh what oh wow fantastic there's a second bat coming in and the second bat carries a dragonfly the dragonfly is about the length of the bat's body and the bat has 
grasps it by the head. The other one looks in an interested way, but doesn't touch the prey. Ah, oh, amazing. It just shovels it with its wing and was close to its face. And now it starts to eat the thorax, that is the area where the wings is. Ah, the first legs already fell. And it very skillfully now kind of dismembers the dragonfly, is chewing and munching on the juicy parts of the dragonfly, all the muscles, the flight muscles. And now it looks like a huge spaghetti hanging out of the bat's mouth. <laughs> Another leg fell. The other bat starts cleaning now in a very careful way, scratching itself, licking its wings. And the bat eating the dragonfly. It looks like munch crunch, that it's a very delicious piece of dinner tonight. <laughs> and then one night, something extraordinary happens. One bat was feeding another bat. Presumably the other bat was not well that night. And so the other bat flew in and brought an insect and, and gave the insect to the other bat to feed. And that is something that is not known for any bat species so far. We know from vampire bats that they share blood when one bat hasn't eaten enough per night. But that one bat actively approaches another one and feeds it, that is literally unheard of. That night, one bat brings another bat a total of 20 insects. This discovery inspires the scientists to study the stairwell intensively. Through tracking and DNA work, they discover that the bats bringing the food are mothers, and the bats getting fed are their offspring. Other animals feed their young, but rarely is behavior like this seen in bats. As mammals, bats nurse their young on milk, but when the young bats are weaned, they should be capable of hunting for themselves. It takes longer, however, for the common large-eared bat to learn how to hunt. Why is that? One of the reasons we think is that maybe it is so difficult for the young to hunt for prey that is hidden in the vegetation so that it just takes a while till the bats are able to feed on their own and need the help of their mothers for a much longer period of time than all the other bats. So the mosaic is getting clearer. 72 species coexist on BCI by choosing different roost sites, from hollow tree trunks to stairwells, from termite nests to lighthouses and they maintain the separation of the species through different mating rituals and different strategies for raising their young. But roosting is only part of the picture. What the bats eat is also critical to their survival. Many of the bats on BCI have a diet of fresh figs. The island has hundreds of fig trees that can provide enough food for thousands of bats. And each tree produces fruit for two to three nights each year. Fig trees have no fixed season, so on any given night, there's always one in fruit. The relationship between bat and fig is timeless. The bats get a delicious meal and in turn do the trees the favor of dispersing their seeds. Bats are just as important as birds in helping trees find new places to sprout. It's becoming clear that the wealth of bat species here is connected to the richness of food produced by the tropical forest. To scientists who first come to BCI, the idea of spending months on end in this tropical jungle sounds like a dream. But in the tropics, dreams can become nightmares. Here, there are poisonous snakes and other nasty creatures out for blood, human blood. Every night before entering the forest, the scientists must protect themselves against mosquitoes, chiggers, and ticks. Long trousers and masking tape usually do the trick. Yet ticks can always find chinks in the armor. For the bat women, the price of knowledge can be an ounce or two of blood. But the bat women have allies to fight the bloodsuckers, the bats themselves. 
many bats are primarily insect eaters, including those being studied by Nina Schwein. Nina is studying an insect eater called the stripe-headed round-eared bat. She wants to know how this bat finds its prey. Her first task is to catch the bats, and to do this, she sets up several mist nets. When I'm out by myself, I, depending on, on the activity and on the how much moon there is or how much rain there is, so I put up between 5 and 13 or 15 nets. Nets in place, Nina waits for night to fall. After just a few hours, Nina finds her nets filling quickly. But these bats are not the ones she's looking for. You know, I sure like bats, but sometimes it can be really frustrating to get data sometimes. When I put up a lot of nets and then I, just get, I get all kind of species, which are nice, but I just can't do anything with them, so I just release them. Nina painstakingly removes dozens of the wrong bats and releases them back into the darkness. Night after night and still no luck. On her sixth night of netting, Nina finally finds the animal she's looking for. Now the real work can begin. The most important step is to get the bat eating in captivity. The bat refuses a Katie did, its staple diet. If Nina can't get it to eat soon, she'll have to release it back into the forest. In the end, a mealworm proves enticing. The food means quick energy for the bat and gives Nina the green light to proceed with her experiment. Nina will study this bat in a flight cage, an enclosure where she can safely keep it for nearly a week of experiments. She wants to discover what cues trigger the bat to attack. Inside the flight cage, she employs a high-tech array of electronics. Two video cameras, infrared light panels, and audio equipment that can slow down bat sounds up to 15 times. Despite popular belief, bats are not blind. In fact, most have good vision. To ensure that eyesight doesn't cue the bat, Nina conducts her trials under varying light sources. She finds that the bat behaves in exactly the same way in visible light as it does in infrared light and even total darkness. Next, Nina tries tempting the bat with plastic katydids thrown to the leaves below.
The bat ignores the plastic dummies. So it must be sound that triggers the bat to hunt. But what kind of sound? Perhaps the sound of a live Katie did walking on leaves will interest it. Though attentive, the bat shows no signs of hunting. Next, Nina tries attaching the insect to a wire. When the Katie did is motionless, the bat ignores it. But as soon as it beats its wings, the bat makes its move. Nina's tests show that the bat does not rely on visual cues to find its prey, nor on the sound of an insect walking or calling from the forest floor. The cue that triggers the bat is nothing more than the sound of the katydid's beating wings. While all bats have extraordinary hearing, the stripe-headed round-eared bat tops them all, with ears that are more than double in size the average. Such large ears allow this bat to home in on the merest whisper of an insect's wing beat. Its highly developed hearing enables this bat to fill a special hunting niche, feasting on katydids and cicadas. Other bats on BCI have completely different hunting strategies, and one in particular hunts right on the Panama Canal. Every day, dozens of ocean-going ships make their way through the canal. But at night, these waters are traversed by a different voyager, the fishing bat. Of all the 72 species on BCI, the fishing bat has the most exotic diet, a kind of bat sushi small fresh fish that it catches just below the water surface. The fishing bat has turned the claws on the end of its long hind legs into fishing hooks, sharp talons that it uses to snare the fish. But how does it know where the fish are? The key is echolocation. Most bats use echolocation by making high-pitched sounds well beyond the hearing range of humans. When those sounds bounce off the surface of an object like its prey, the bat listens to the returning echoes and decodes them to figure out the texture, shape, size, and movement of its prey. All this data is processed by the bat's brain in an astonishingly brief amount of time, no more than the blink of an eye. To help her understand exactly how the fishing bat hunts, Elizabeth must slow down the action using stop-frame photography. She hooks up two cameras to a bank of 12 strobes, which are programmed to fire sequentially every 50 milliseconds. As the bat passes by, she pulls the trigger. The cameras freeze the action into an extraordinary sequence, revealing shots that break down the lightning-fast behavior of the hunt. This picture here shows us a capture of a fish. The bat flies here with outstretched wings, and you may even see that it touches the water surface lightly with its wingtips. It gets closer and closer to the target, homes in on it, and then hits the water surface full force with its really sharp claws. So the whole capture sequence from the start till the beginning is less than 200 milliseconds, which I think is really astounding for this really delicate procedure in finding out where the prey is and plucking it from the water surface, getting it into the tail pouch and taking it out. The fish-eating bat has a unique diet and specialized hunting technique that assures its survival on BCI.
But it's not the only aquatic hunter here. Another bat patrols the island's creek beds. During the day, these creek beds are quiet, but as night falls, they are transformed into a raucous meeting ground for frogs. Male Tungara frogs use the cover of darkness to court females. Their mating calls fill the forest. But other ears are listening too. The frog-eating bat pays close attention. The frogs are in a tight spot caught between the need to make themselves known to each other and their need to remain undetected by hungry bats. And the frog-eating bat is a voracious eater. A single bat can eat up to 15 frogs each night, nearly matching its own body weight. For the last two years, Rachel Page has been studying this duel between the bat and the frog. These bats prey on a certain type of frog. They prey on Tungara frogs. And this frog, the male frog, produces two types of call, a complex call and a simple call. Female frogs prefer complex calls to simple ones. So the question is, if that's the case, if male frogs get more matings when they produce complex calls, then why would a male frog produce anything but a complex call? To answer this question, Rachel sets up an experiment in the flight cage. She prepares a replica forest floor in the flight cage, and underneath it, she places speakers that will play audio recordings of the Tungara frog calls. She plays the frog calls in random order. And sure enough, it's the complex calls that get the bats most excited. So this is really interesting because it's placing the male frog in this position where it has to choose between a successful mating possibility or a greater risk of predation. So it's definitely this pull between sexual selection on the one hand and then the other. You just need to be able to survive. So frogs should use the shorter, simpler calls if they want to live. But the urge to mate means that a longer, more complex call might just be their swan song. In fact, this bat is such a good hunter of frogs, Rachel wonders if this is programmed into its genes. What's cool about these bats is they are very specialized on frogs during the wet season, but then during the dry season, when there aren't nearly as many frogs and there aren't as many frogs calling, and they need the calls to hone in on the frogs and get them, um, they eat all kinds of other stuff. Rachel sets up a second experiment. She wants to see if she can train the frog-eating bat to respond to the calls of a poisonous toad. In just two nights, she succeeds in teaching the bat to respond to the toad call by rewarding it with minnows. But in the real world, eating a poisonous toad could kill the bat, so this behavior is clearly not inherited. It's exciting because it means that these bats are not, if, even if, I mean, there may be a genetic component to their preference for frog calls, but it's certainly not a fixed quality. Before she releases the bats back to the wild, Rachel returns them to their taste for frogs. 
Her experiment shows how bats can learn new cues and adapt to changes in the availability of different prey. Another huge piece of the mosaic is in place. The bat women are showing that 72 species can coexist not only by using different roost sites, but by feeding on different food. From insects to frogs to fish, bats divide up the food resources of the forest. They specialize in different diets. But there's an even more surprising way that the bats share their forest home, by carving up space and time. The scientists' living quarters are surrounded on all sides by the bats' natural rainforest habitat. And living in the midst of the forest can rub off. At carnival time, the researchers revel in being more sylvan than scientists. They take off their lab coats and don a new apparel, dressing as nymphs and green elves. <laughs> For Fanny Vetterick, bow and arrow are not mere party props. They're legitimate scientific tools. And the only way to get a bat catching net up high into the canopy without having to climb a tree. Fani is investigating where insect-eating bats hunt for prey like mosquitoes and gnats. Insects can be found in all parts of the forest, so it would seem logical that insect-eating bats are competing for prey. But Fani suspects that different bat species hunt in different parts of the forest. To prove her idea, she uses a mist net 30 meters high, marked at one meter intervals, to pinpoint at exactly what height each bat is caught. Hauling a heavy net up to the treetops is a challenge, but the rewards are great. And for the first time, the high nets are allowing Fanny to discover exactly how the bats divide the forest from bottom to top. I would like to have a better view of the whole community of bats of this island and there has been a lot of work done since a lot of time but it has been always ground net all the time and I mean you know that bats are flying so some might be flying really high and some species might be flying only very high and you will never get them on the ground net. <laughs> Hours later, Fanny pulls a high flyer down to ground level. Some call this bat the swift of the night. It has very narrow wings that enable it to fly extremely fast and actually catch insects in midair. This bat knows how to eat and run. It even consumes its prey while in flight. Fanny's high nets prove that bats do indeed hunt at different heights in the tropical forest. But there's a fourth dimension in our mosaic still to consider, not just space, but time. Jody Sedlock is investigating the time of night when different bats visit a clearing in the forest. These clearings are created when a tall tree falls, creating a temporary opening in the dense vegetation. Jody begins by first measuring the density of insects at given hours through the night. She uses a bug catcher putting it high up into the canopy to collect samples of the insects flying around.
That task done, she can now turn her attention to the bats and discover what time each species visits the clearing. To do this, she uses a bat detector, which can record the bat's high-pitched echolocation calls. What it does is it takes these high-frequency sounds and it records them into a digital memory and then slows it down 10 times. So here I'll play back the slowed down calls. And this is great because when we look at these calls, it retains all of the different attributes of the call that allows us to identify species. The echolocation calls of many bat species are so distinctive, they can be used as species identifiers. Need to move, please. No, just start it, but... Oh, right there. You see that? Yeah. yeah. 77 high activity in the gap, and now Komura Borobrostris has arrived. I think. And I would predict would leave soon. Yes, it will. <laughs> It'll minutes. leave around, yeah, 10 minutes. Maximum five minutes, 10 minutes. minutes. Be gone. Listen to it. Wow. Oh, that's a nice one. That's a wonderful one. This, the short calls are emitted when they are close to the vegetation. Ah, oh, okay. And they can change short They can change signal very nicely. The recordings reveal something remarkable. Different bat species appear in the tree clearing at different times of the night. It's like different eating slots at a cafeteria. Some bats show up earlier and leave just a few minutes later before the next gang arrives. So competing bat species that hunt the same prey not only choose different levels of the forest canopy, they also choose different times of night to forage. The pieces of our mosaic are finally all in place. The forest on BCI can sustain 72 different species of bats because these animals are amazing specialists. To reduce competition, they specialize in at least four different dimensions. They specialize by diet. Some prefer fish, others fruit, others frogs. They specialize in their choice of roost, from termite nests to tents to tree hollows. They specialize spatially, by hunting only at the tops of trees or in the thick lower canopy. And finally, they specialize temporarily, by picking their favorite hour to hunt. The bats fill the forest to capacity, yet they find remarkable ways to live together by being different. But despite their differences, all of these bats need the same basic thing to survive, a healthy forest. It's an irony of modern life that the man-made Panama Canal created a permanent bat haven and an ideal laboratory for the bat women of Panama. A lot of people actually think about my work that it's really crazy to go out at night and to basically eaten by chiggers and ticks and because it is exhausting work that we're doing here and when you have to work all night. On the other hand, I think many people would also like seeing these things that we experience at night, but they have no opportunity to go there to really see it. And I can only say, well, try it. These are the wonders of the world.